This is not my Europe. That's what politician-turned-human rights activist Norbert Blum says about Europe's refugee policies. Welcome. Hello. And welcome, viewers, to the DW interview. I'm Thomas Spahn. Mr. Blum, you're 80 years old. You spent a night in a tent in the mud at the refugee camp in Idomeni, Greece. Were you able to get any sleep? No, but that's not important. After all, I was just there for one night. What is important is that people have been sleeping in the mud there for weeks. We have to tell people what's going on at that camp, and not secondhand either. That's why I went there. And I think if you go to that camp, you have to share the refugee experience. I would feel wrong just standing around looking at them. It's not a zoo where you observe exotic animals. If you share their experience, even briefly, it's a symbolic act of solidarity. So you see that camp as a symbol of Europe shutting itself off from the refugees. What should Europe do? Europe should show solidarity. Europe has 500 million people. It should be possible to take in a few million refugees. But Europe is being selfish and refuses to do this. This is not my Europe, but I'm repeating myself. But is Europe really that hard-hearted? The refugees in Idomeni could move to a different camp. They could apply for asylum in Greece. Chancellor Merkel says refugees don't have the right to choose where they'll seek asylum. Regarding free choice, yes, there are other camps in Greece. I was at some of them. The difference is not that great. It's just as cold, maybe a bit drier. You have to realize that these people are desperate. They've been through horrible experiences. They're not tourists. They're fighting for their lives, and we have to help them. That's the question, do we help them or not? But they're already in Greece. Surely the refugees in Greece are safe from persecution. Well, if you consider that situation safe, three, no, five tents away from mine, a mother was lying on the wet ground with her five-day-old child. Couldn't she move to another camp? She'd still have a newborn baby, and they'd still be out in the cold. Take them in. I mean, what kind of bureaucratic hard-heartedness is this? These are human beings, people fighting for their lives. We shouldn't look at them as statistics. 50,000 in Greece, that's a statistic. But behind the numbers, there are horrible experiences. I met a man whose hand had been chopped off. He'd been an attorney in Mosul, Iraq, and he'd represented non-believers. So the Islamic State fighters chopped off his hand. Then he fled Iraq with his wife and two children. They ended up in a rubber dinghy in the sea between Turkey and Greece, and the dinghy sank. His wife was rescued by the Greeks, and the Turks rescued him and his two children. The difference is the Greeks let his wife move on through Europe. She's now in Germany, but he and the kids are stuck in a camp. I don't think we need an extended philosophical discussion about this. Families belong together, especially in situations like this. The conditions in some camps are horrible, but back in 1993, when you were a cabinet minister, the lower house of the German parliament decided that no one who was already in a safe country would receive asylum in Germany. Was this law that you signed off on wrong? The asylum law was approved in a completely different situation. Germany was still divided. The law still says that those who are politically persecuted must be granted asylum. And the Dublin Agreement is still in effect. An application for asylum must be made in the first country where the refugee arrives. But now we're not dealing with individual asylum seekers. This is a mass migration of persecuted people. And Europe is shutting itself off. 
If we leave it to the countries they first arrive in, the weakest links in the European chain, Greece, Italy, while we sit in our comfortable homes and say it's none of our business, that is not going to turn out well. And if Hungary, Poland and Austria put up the Iron Curtain again and close their borders, which we were so happy to be rid of, it'll be a major setback. Europe's strategy and Chancellor Merkel's strategy is this. Those refugees who have no chance for asylum will be sent back to Turkey. If you say, this is no longer my Europe, then is Merkel no longer your chancellor? No, I support her. She's one of the few who fought national selfishness. Europe has 28 nation states, and they're all motivated by national interests. But Merkel was different. And it's high time to implement the rest of what she proposes. You can look at it any way you want. Europe needs to compromise and create a common asylum law and work together to organize the distribution of refugees. Otherwise, it will not have fulfilled its historical mission. Look at the contrast. When it comes to rescuing the banks, all the national leaders bent over backward to save the banks and the euro. But this time it's not about money, it's about human beings. That's one of the topics of your new book, which criticizes what you call the merciless money society. You say that Europe is obsessed with money and ignores people. Now, don't think I'm a hopeless dreamer. I don't want to do away with money. It's one of humanity's most useful inventions perhaps right up there with the wheel. It made trade possible, and thus the diversification of labor. But money should not be used as a wealth machine. A means has become an end in itself. Today you can earn more money with money than you can with work. You get richer by buying and selling companies than you do by producing goods and services. In one year, Porsche made 3 billion euros more in profits than it did in sales. How did they do that? Not by manufacturing cars, but by lending money. Is that fair? It's like an expanding oil slick. Everything can be bought. There's almost nothing that can't be bought. Even life can be bought. You can pay a surrogate mother in India to spare you the effort of giving birth. But giving birth is part of the joy of having children. You can pay to have yourself frozen and possibly revived later on. You can pay for a relationship partner. You can buy almost everything, but there are a few things, probably the best ones, that money can't buy. If I may interrupt, many people are obsessed with money. We've seen that in the Panama Papers, which document cases of tax avoidance around the world. Does the extent of these kinds of tax deals surprise you? No. I've seen these letterbox companies with my own eyes when I was in the Cayman Islands. You didn't open an account? No, I didn't. But there's a building there, not the biggest building in the world, but 15,000 companies are registered there. It's full of letterbox companies. But it's legal. This is a perversion of the economy. I think an essential part of a company is work, whatever kind. Services, production. Then how can it be legal? Because money has come to rule the world. Part of the reason is that the economy, which Ludwig Erhard conceived as a social market economy, no longer operates nationally. So it can't be controlled nationally. Today, money operates globally, while politics still operates nationally. 
That's why Europe has to work together to resolve serious problems, including financial problems, climate problems, terrorism, because these are international issues. But all sides have to agree on solutions. Yes, but national governments will also have to surrender some of their authority. The European Parliament needs to decide on a Europe-wide refugee policy. We need a pan-European finance minister. 99% of the currency that circles the globe has nothing to do with work. We can control it only with more powerful political structures. Mr. Bloom, we always end our interview with three unfinished statements. Please complete them. And since you once studied theology, I thought we could talk about faith, hope and love. The first statement, money rules the world, but I have faith that... Money won't have the last word. Ideas are more powerful. My Christian-based critique of capitalism has prompted some to call me a heart of Jesus Marxist. I consider this an honor, because I don't mind being mentioned in association with the words heart of Jesus. That question was about love, now for hope. Despite all the crises, my hope for Europe's future is that wisdom will prevail and that Europe will discover its true purpose to develop policies that promote humanity and dignity. Norbert Blum, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks.